Yeah, so I spent the last five years turning around this portfolio company, uh, Warburg Pink is a private equity firm portfolio company, and um, left about six weeks ago. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about the company really at all, but I'm talk about kind of one of the many things that I learned during that, during that turnaround. Um, and that is uh, um, that good is better than being excellent, which sounds kind of self-contradictory almost, especially if you grew up playing the Marvel superheroes role-playing game by the makers of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, if you look at the back page of the player's handbook, they obviously have the rankings of every single possible term from feeble through to unearthly. And if you look here in the middle, you can see that um, excellent is clearly better than good, right? <laughs> Typical, good, excellent, remarkable. Um, very, 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 very clear. Uh, uh, and so, how, how is this possible? How, how can I talk about excellent being better than good? It's kind of like saying that Batman can beat Superman, which, which <laughs> also is impossible, right? One guy is just a normal human, the other person is like the strongest person in, in the universe. Um, and yet, in the five times that Batman has fought Superman in the history of DC Comics, he has won every single time. <laughs> every single, he's undefeated. He is like the Harlem Globetrotters to Superman's Washington Generals. Uh, uh, so if Batman can beat Superman, maybe good can be better than excellent. Uh, McKinsey and Company is a, is a consulting firm. Um, I guess they're kind of like Deloitte. Um, <laughs> Alex and I both work there. Uh, they, they're the most expensive consulting firm. Uh, I don't know if you call them the best or not, but they charge the most. Um, <laughs> and, and what they care about more than anything else is uh, uh, having really, really smart people that they can charge out at really ridiculous rates. Right? That's their business model. Hire really smart people and then charge them out to clients who couldn't afford to hire those people at even higher rates than they otherwise would get them for. Right? Um, and so in order to make that work, they need to hire those really smart people. And they're super analytic about it, right? They want to make sure they bring those people in in the best possible way possible. Um, and so they do tons and tons of analytics on hiring. Um, they do something called the case interview, uh, or something called the story problem, where they basically put people through this ringer of interviews, like multiple rounds across uh, uh, seven, eight different people diving into these business problems, similar to what they'll be doing when they're on the job, trying to find the people that are best the best possible people to bring in the front door. And so you would think that, again, this company cares about talent more than anything else in the world. They're super analytic about everything they do, and they have an intense interview process. You would think the interview scores they have for the candidates they end up hiring, and how well the person does on the job, would look something like this, right? Interview scores along the bottom, performance on the job along the other, on the y-axis, and there'd be some sort of like, there's noise, but they generally look pretty correlated. Um, at least that's what I thought. The data looks like this. No correlation at all. No correlation between how well someone does in the interview and how well they do on the job. Zero correlation. And so that's crazy. Like, just think about that for a little bit and what that means. That means that uh, a homeless guy who presumably would do very, very bad on the interview, and Elon, oh, what happened there? And Elon Musk, who I lost my picture of, uh, uh, who presumably would do very, very good on the interview, um, that interview score doesn't correlate to how well they do on the job. The homeless guy or Elon Musk could be just as good on the job based on their interview performance. And that just doesn't make any sense. Uh, there, there, there he is. Hey, Elon. Um, uh, that doesn't make any sense at all, right? Um, and yet that's what the data is saying. So let's talk about the NFL. Uh, and specifically, let's talk about the kickers in the NFL. Kickers in the NFL are really, really great in that it's really easy to tell who's a good kicker and who a bad kicker is. Right? Like, another, like other occupations in, in football where this, it's a team sport and the quarterback might be good or maybe the defensive line that was good, who knows? The kicker is an isolated incident where all they're trying to do is kick a ball through the uprights. I'm talking about place kicking for field goals. Um, and this is NFL, but it can, CFL, same idea, right? Just kick it through the posts. Um, and. and uh, uh, so you should be able to tell who a good kicker is by the end of the season, who a bad kicker is, right? All you got to do is look at uh, how far they had to kick, so how difficult it was, was basically how far they had to kick, and uh, were they successful or not, did they put it through the uprights or not? And so those two things, uh, uh, you should be able to know who the good kicker is. Uh, and it's a high skill occupation, so you should be able to see if they're really good this year, they're probably going to be really good next year. Well, this is what you actually see. This is 
the x-axis is the percentage success on field goals in year one as a kicker from 2008-2015, and the y-axis is percentage success in year two. It's the same thing as we saw in McKinsey. There's zero correlation. The best kickers in the league in the first season are just freaking random noise in the second season. Like, three of them above average, four below average. The worst kickers in the league in the first season, four above average and three below average. In fact, there's a slightly negative correlation, which means that the worst kicker in the league is slightly more likely to be the best kicker in the league next season than the best kicker in the league. <laughs> which also makes no sense, because I can tell you that kicking is a skill. I know that if I was in the NFL, I would be the worst kicker in the NFL. And I can tell you I'd be the worst kicker in the NFL this season and next season. My performance would be highly correlated from season to season. And yet when you look at actual kickers in the NFL, there is no correlation at all in their performance from season to season. It's like roulette. But again, roulette is a friggin' random chance thing. Like, you could expect that if I'm terrible at roulette this year, I'm going to be terrible at roulette. I, 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 I could be just as good. I could be awesome next year. And I'm the best roulette player this year. Maybe I'll be a random, terrible roulette player next year. Because no, there's no skill involved. But both McKinsey consultants and kickers in the NFL are high skill occupations. And yet we're seeing the same impact as if they were freaking roulette players. Doesn't make any sense. What's going on? I call it the kink. I'm over here in the CFL and the NFL kicker. I am so, so, so terrible that my performance will correlate from season to season. I'll, be, I'll miss all my field goals every single year. Um, the homeless guy in the street is over here when he comes to McKinsey. He's gonna do terrible in the interview and he's gonna do terrible on the job. Uh, but once you get over to this area, it stops being correlated. Once you get to a certain level of goodness, we lose our ability to differentiate between who's better and who's worse. And what's worse is we screen out the bad. We do this. We say, hey, if you don't have this score in the interview, you're not going to get a job. If you don't have this ability, you're not going to get into the NFL. And so what we're left with is the people in this section. The only people we can see are the people who are so far to the right that their performance no longer correlates with their performance from season to season or from job to job, from, from pre, to, pre to post. What it means is, if, in order to be successful, what you really need to do is eliminate this part, the part you can see. We, we know, we can identify, we, we're able to figure out the difference between poor and good. We are not able to identify in many cases the difference between ex, good and excellent. And yet, we still keep trying because we feel like we should be able to tell. And so, McKinsey pushes for the people who get this score in the interview and say, these are the people we want to hire. Ooh, these people, they barely made the cut. I don't know if I want to hire this person or not. But there's no difference between those two people. We pay the first person in the NFL, the, the person who kicks ass the kicker and is the number one in the league, we give them a bigger contract and pay them millions of dollars, and the worst kicker in the league, we talk about kicking them out. But there's no difference between those two people. Uh, and that's what I call the good enough problem. And it happens everywhere. So we see it in parenting, in teachers, in regulatory systems, in medicine, in A-B testing, in wine, in art, in dating, in venture capital, in barbers, in uh, the ability of police officer to detect lies. All of these things have the same characteristics of this good enough problem, and we keep chasing excellence and wasting our time while we're chasing excellence, and we should be focusing on doing good. Um, and so that's what I'm doing. I've left my company, uh, and I'm writing this book. I'm going to explain all this phenomenon, how it happens, and then, more importantly, what do you do about it now that you know this problem exists? How do you actually run companies trying to be good enough and stop trying to be excellent? Uh, I have to ask, uh, I'm sure you've heard of a book by a person named Jim Collins. Good to great. I probably get this a lot, but I'm curious what your response is about how you go from good to great and why your argument as to why you should stick with good. Uh, so Jim Collins wrote a book. Like, the question is, uh, how does this relate to the book Good to Great by Jim Collins? Um, Jim Collins wrote a book that used lots and lots and lots of data. That's probably what the most, every press release on that book talked about how much data they dug into to pull out these insights. Um, and it's all BS. It's all BS. The whole book is BS. If you look at uh, the, the companies he predicted that, that actually were successful, that went from good to great, and then you look at how they performed after, instead of looking backwards, instead of looking forwards, they, 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 it wasn't predictive at all. The same problem with In Search of Excellence, 
that with, with Tom, uh, Tom Peters wrote another McKinsey guy 20, uh, two decades earlier. Um, uh, it's really easy to, uh, Duncan Watts actually wrote a much better book, and it's called uh, Everything is Obvious Once You Know the Answer. Uh, and, and, and it's true. It's really, it, it's really easy to predict backwards. It's much harder to predict forwards. And Jim Collins did a great job of predicting backwards and then pulling out these insights. Um, but his base level of data just didn't predict forwards. So how valuable are those insights? Well, do you think it's possible that uh, the wrong uh, data is being looked at when it comes to picking people in whatever... Uh, you know, venture you're in to try to pick people. Do you think that could be the problem, or do you think it just you can't actually get the data that would predict good to excellent? Uh, so this doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes you actually do want to be excellent. For example, if you are the McKinsey, per the person interviewing for the McKinsey job, you're only going to get the job if you're really good in the interview. You need to be excellent in the interview. Even if that doesn't correlate to your performance later, you don't care about your performance later, you want the job now. Uh, and so there are times when being excellent is the, the, the smart thing to do. Um, and, and so it varies from uh, quarterbacks, for example. We can't actually predict the performance of quarterbacks from season to season. Kickers is the example that you can't predict. Um, and so sometimes you want to be excellent, sometimes you want to be good. But uh, uh, most of the time, uh, good is the right answer. Um, it, just, it, it depends on the situation. Uh, the other question, uh, that I guess I kind of answered your question, but not really. Uh, your question was around how do we, uh, uh, if we just knew more, would we, would we get the answer? Is it just a matter of just being smarter? Um, and maybe. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, we spend so much time chasing excellence that there's an opportunity cost to that, and we're not doing the good. Um, I, I used an, an example earlier tonight when I, when I was chatting with Becky about um, if you want to try to become the best tennis player on the planet and you're successful and you're the number one tennis player on the planet, that's a pretty freaking great job. Um, but if you miss it and you're the top 5% tennis player on the planet, you don't even get paid to be the top 5% tennis player on the planet. You're an amateur at that point. If you want to become uh, uh, a top 5% teacher on the planet, you're making $60,000 a year as a teacher at a public school. But if you're the top 20% in tennis and the top 20% as a teacher, uh, you're now a, 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 a tennis coach making uh, high six figures. And so sometimes by focusing on just being good on a number of different things, you can be far more successful than shooting for the excellence. And it's not that it's impossible. Someone's the top tennis player on the planet. Um, and someone found a way to do it. But I wouldn't bet on it. I wouldn't be, that's not where I'd throw my, my, my chips where I had them. So this must have some impacts on uh, HR practices. Maybe you could sense, shed some light on that. Uh, yeah, it's 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 almost impossible to interview for excellence. Almost, well, I, I think it is impossible. Well, it may it may be possible someday. We have not figured it out yet. Um, so can you was here presenting last month, um, and uh, um, they'll they'll tell you the same thing. They actually started their model trying to find ways to find awesome engineers, and they weren't able to do it. Where they got success was focusing on eliminating the bad, and so for an engineer, you want someone who's really 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 great. For a truck driver, you want someone who's going to show up on time and not get in an accident. Um, and so the so can you model for HR and doing predictions is they were actually very, very good at, at eliminating the bad truck drivers and finding people who are good truck drivers. They were very, very, very bad at predicting who's going to be an excellent engineer versus a, a good engineer. Thanks, Alex.